Good morning, everyone. My name is Carter Latondres, and I'm the Peacemaking Core Ministry Facilitator here at First Congregational United Church of Christ, Portland. First off, I'd like to lead with some joy right now and some relief regarding the presidential election yesterday. A message of unity prevailed over one of division, and we have our first woman of color as vice president. I am joyful. I also note that with the election results, we can be parents again without being contradicted by the president. We can tell our kids again that honesty, kindness, facts, and admitting mistakes all matter. We, we can tell our kids that bullying and lying are wrong, and we can do so with the confidence that our parenting won't be disparaged by presidential tweets. At the same time, look at the popular vote. 70 million Americans voted for Trump and Pence. What I wanna to say to you this morning is not explicitly about politics or the election, and I'm going to leave this topic in a second, but we should be mindful that nearly half of voting America didn't get what they wanted yesterday. While it's true that I reject the hate and intolerance of the far right, I also don't wanna demonize Trump voters Instead, I want to better understand their pain and motivations. We have to find a way to meet them with hope, not hate, and to figure out how to proceed forward together. Regardless of how we voted, though, this church celebrates diversity, inclusivity, and equity. And we were troubled by Trump's xenophobia and bigotry, including his refusal to more clearly condemn white supremacy. I'd like to turn to that topic of racism and talk about how it has functioned in my own life. Since early summer, I've been working with the Equity Group, the Portland Protest Aid Station Group, and the Wednesday Night Anti-Racism Discussion Group here at UCC. This work was jump-started, you'll remember, by the horrific murder of George Floyd and the subsequent Black Lives Matter uprisings here in our city and across the world. They're still ongoing. Over the past several months, I've been fortunate to do important anti-racist anti work with you all. And together, we have discovered new issues for some of us, including being co-conspirators, getting right-sized egos, using growth mindsets, and confronting systemic racism in our society's institutions. In order to better understand our ongoing engagement with these issues, I'd like to tell you a story this morning. The story is both personal and professional. It's about me mistaking guilt and pride for accountability, and then later learning that these maneuvers were actually forms of my own white fragility and racism. You see, in addition to being a congregate at this church, I am also a middle school English teacher and I've spent 25 years teaching reading and writing to young people. Every fall, I prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion and choose to teach books with authors who identify as Black, Indigenous, People of Color, BIPOC, and LGBTQIA+. The story I'd like to tell you is how over time, slowly, I came to believe that I was a good white person and a feminist and somehow I had transcended my own race and gender privileges. This arrogance led me to draw some false conclusions. They led me to do some things I'm not proud of and allowed me to learn some of the great lessons of my adult life. For a number of years between 2015 and 2018, I taught a novel called Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry by Mildred Taylor. It is set in Mississippi in 1933 and the African-American author Mildred Taylor has a few cruel white characters use the N-word to describe the novel's protagonist and her family. During that time, 2015 to 2018, I was often angry and despondent when I was teaching that book. Angry and despondent with the police killing of Eric Garner caught on video, with President Trump for his condemnation of Colin Kaepernick, with President Trump's hot mic boasting admission that he grabs women by the genitals, with Trump for not condemning David Duke, for Trump calling Mexican newcomers to this country rapists, for Trump's Muslim ban, 
I could go on. You all remember those early days of the president's term. With this frustrated and often outraged mindset, in order to give my students background information for understanding the novel Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, I had them read about the history of systemic racism in this country. We read ta Coates's long essay, The Case for Reparations, and excerpts from Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, so that we could learn about how the history of the 20th century is in part the history of affirmative action for white people at the expense of BIPOC Americans. Different institutions, including the Federal Housing Authority, state lending institutions, state and county real estate and school boards, we learned, allowed white male American soldiers to return from World War II, utilize the GI Bill and low interest home loans to begin, to begin building wealth in racially and economically segregated schools and neighborhoods. My own grandfather took advantage of these programs. We learned how redlining and racially restrictive covenants allowed white families to not only build wealth here in Portland, but to pass that wealth down intergenerationally to their children and grandchildren. For example, we studied how in the Albina district here in Portland, one can trace systemic racism from the early 20th century to today, from segregation to redlining, to discriminatory lending practices, to urban renewal projects like the building of the Coliseum and the Lloyd Center, to gentrification, all leading to the fracturing of Portland's Black community and to today's obscene racial wealth gap in this city and in this country. These forces were not inevitable. They were choices made by white male power brokers for the benefit of white families here in our city and in this country. When I was teaching during this time from 2015 to 2018, I see now that I was posturing as a lonely social justice warrior with a white savior complex. I saw myself as a hero bravely confronting the indifference of white people I knew. In my alarm over Trump and the repeated killings of unarmed African-American people, I also exaggerated what I assumed was the indifference of other white people who could have been my potential allies if I were to only give them a chance. Then one day, about five years ago, I read the N-word in class from Taylor's novel. It was the first time I'd ever said the word aloud. I read it two or three other times, I think over the course of two years in class and two students. I've not used the word since then when I stopped teaching the novel in 2018. I think in my outrage and desperation, I wanted to shock white people into action. I assumed that my white students and their parents, along with my white administrators, were ignoring the racial injustices of the past and occurring all around us today. Their silence on the killings of Eric Garner and other unarmed African-American citizens, along with Trump's racism. I'm remembering now the very fine people on both sides comment, did suggest at least that they were willfully ignoring white violence against black citizens and anti-racist activists. I also assumed that people, including my students, knew, knew my reputation as a politically progressive educator, that people knew I was one of the good white people. Most crucially, I see now, I also assumed my race and gender at that moment were somehow invisible, incidental, and beneath me somehow. On June 2nd of this year, in seeking to ally itself to the Black Lives Matter movement after George Floyd's murder, my employer used a blackout icon on its Instagram account in solidarity with Blackout Tuesday. An outpouring of anger followed. People called for certain administrators and teachers to be fired and to resign, including me. People called my employer racist one anonymous Instagram poster posted the following, which I'll show you now. Carter Latondras, verbally abusive, used the N-word with a hard R on many occasions. 
traumatized me and my fellow black peers, including my younger siblings who he taught as well. Despite numerous complaints, our concerns were always brushed under the rug. Want to fix the damage you've caused? Start by firing this pathetic excuse of a man. That's all I'm going to say. I've thought a lot about that anonymous post over the past five months. My first thought was that the post came from a white troll, one of the children of white families angry with me for, not te for teaching about unearned intergenerational white privilege and systemic racism. My employer investigated this Instagram post, the head of school, the director of human resources, the school's lawyer were all involved. They tried to contact the anonymous Instagram poster about me being verbally abusive and about numerous complaints brushed under the rug. Both of these statements were new to me as well, and I also wanted to know more about them. I still want to sit down face to face with the person who wrote this. Unfortunately, the person who posted on Instagram did not respond. As you can imagine, I've spent many painful but necessary hours in both self-reflection and in conversation with friends, colleagues at work, and church members about this Instagram post. This summer, after the events I've described, I was floundering about emotionally, denying, deflecting, whatever lessons I might learn from it. At the same time, even though I mostly vacillated between anger, self-pity, righteous indignation, I was also keen to understand what was happening to me, to my school, to my country. I read a book on anti-racist teaching called Letting Go of Literary Whiteness. A passage in that book hit me between the eyes and finally allowed me to hear the Instagram post. In it, the authors quote a 1982 first person account from a black man named Alan B. Ballard, who had to read Huck Finn in high school. Ballard writes, quote, I can still recall the anger I felt as my white classmates read aloud the N word. In fact, I can, as I write this letter, I'm getting angry all over again. I wanted to sink into my seat. Some of the whites snickered, others giggled. I can recall nothing of the literary merits of this work that people term the greatest of American novels. I only recall the sense of relief I felt when I would flip ahead a few pages and see that the N-word would not be read that hour. Like Mr. Ballard, the student who wrote the Instagram post, I assume, did not remember my teaching about systemic racism or unearned white privilege. My student only remembered the trauma of hearing the N-word come out of my mouth. It did not matter that I was reading it from a book or how I saw myself. My intentions did not matter. What is important I see now was the impact of my actions. I was a white man. I am a white man in a position of authority and I betrayed my students. I harmed them. I was ver verbally abusive. I did traumatize them. These admissions as painful as they are to admit even now are all true. Since reading Ballard's words, I've stopped telling myself that the Instagram poster was a white troll. I now assume that the person is a former 12 year old BIPOC student of mine, whom I betrayed and harmed. Once I set the race of the person posting on Instagram in my mind, I was able to begin a thorough inventory to the best of my ability of my unintentional racist actions and racist curricula over the years in my classroom. I noted that years ago, maybe 20 or so, and for several years, I taught To Kill a Mockingbird in middle school. It's still considered a classic in many school districts. I no longer teach it though, in part because it contains the N-word and in part because of the relationship between the characters of Tom Robinson and Atticus Finch. Here's a quick plot summary. The novel is set in the mid 1930s in a small town of Maycomb, Alabama. Atticus Finch is a smart, kind, dignified white lawyer who has been appointed to defend the innocent Tom Robinson 
a black man who has been wrongly accused of raping a white woman. Robinson is found guilty by a racist all white jury despite all the evidence of his innocence. He goes to jail and when attempting to escape, he is shot dead. What I realized this summer about To Kill a Mockingbird was that around the time I was teaching Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, just three short years ago and reading the N-word in class, I loved Atticus Finch. I remember teaching this book years ago with pride as I identified myself with Atticus Finch. I also noticed today how I virtually ignored the ending where Tom Robinson is tragically murdered by a racist criminal justice system. Reviewing what that Atticus loved this summer, I saw how I have been conditioned by years of white savior stories in movies like The Blind Side, The Help, and Green Book, and in novels like Huckleberry Finn and To Kill a Mockingbird, to love and emulate the good white heroes in those stories who were standing up for and saving the oppressed people of color. That's what I saw myself as doing in my own classroom, even as I was uttering the N-word. When I was made to look in the mirror this summer by the gift of the Instagram post, I saw Atticus Finch staring back at me a well-intentioned liberal white man who was fighting the good fight for BIPOC victims without losing any of his own power and who could sadly shrug his shoulders at his own unearned white privilege as the unfortunate way of the world. I realized while looking at Atticus Finch in the mirror that Tom Robinson in the novel, the black man unjustly convicted of rape and later murdered, was easily forgotten, that his tragic death at the end of the book was rarely discussed by readers or even noted by me as a teacher of that book. Instead, all the focus was still on Atticus being a good white person. But when George Floyd was murdered this summer, I realized that Tom Robinson was George Floyd, another unarmed black man killed by law enforcement and that I was Atticus Finch. Today, I realize that being Atticus is not enough. I can't stride forward as a white savior teacher, teach my anti-racism lessons, and then shrug my shoulders about white privilege. The sad truth? I'm not sure I would have realized all this without being called out on Instagram. I've also learned about my own cultural elitism, about how I have sought to shame other white people for their racism while ignoring my own. I didn't know I was doing this at the time, but I see now that my education level and ability to use anti-racist vocabulary, words like cultural appropriation and microaggressions were themselves daily microaggressions used against white moderates and conservatives at my colleagues and my students and their parents to not only shame them, but to show my own moral superiority this flawed way of supposedly standing up for equity was as much about virtue signaling my own woke status as it was about anti-racism. So where am I today as a teacher, as a person? I know I've done a lot of good in the classroom over the years, but reviewing my career this summer, I've also had to admit that I've done a lot of harm to both BIPOC and white students. The church has been my guiding light over the past few months. During the Wednesday night anti-racism discussion group meetings, during the Thursday night equity group meetings, and on all those Friday and Saturday nights that our Portland protest aid station was open, I had dozens and dozens of tough conversations regarding race, my own white fragility, white privilege and racism. I'm thankful to you all for that. Over the course of these past five months, I've begun developing what capacity to be what Bettina Love calls a co-conspirator with BIPOC folks and other anti-racist white folks who peacefully oppose racism and other oppressions. If I am being a co-conspirator, I've learned, I will, I will be able to seek input, advice, and viewpoints of BIPOC folks and other white justice seekers while being able to listen to critical feedback non-defensively. Less and less these days do I need validation that I am a good white person. More and more these days, I wanna focus on Tom Robinson and the students 
whom I have harmed in the past, both BIPOC and white, and less and less on Atticus Finch and other white savior teachers. This Instagram shaming and the realizations that followed this summer have therefore been some of the great gifts of my adult life. The experience has opened my eyes and set me on a path that asks for my honesty, humility, and compassion for all people, including myself. I know I will continue to make mistakes when doing anti-racist work. And I'm aware that the path will last all the days of my life. Rather than being an ally like Atticus Finch, I would like to become what Dr. Bettina Love calls a co-conspirator. Allies, Dr. Love writes, don't have to question their privilege or decenter their voice or build meaningful relationships with folks working in the struggle or take risks or be in solidarity with others. They just have to show up and mark the box present. Thus allyship, says Dr. Love, is both performative and self-glorifying. By contrast, Dr. Love says co-conspirators work towards understanding where we stand in relation to systems of privilege and oppression and unlearning the habits and practices that protect those systems, which is lifelong work. Co-conspirators work towards authentic relationships of solidarity and mutuality, which are not possible when we try to avoid or transcend power imbalances. Co-conspirators work towards honestly acknowledging and confronting those imbalances to create authentic relationships. The equity group has been especially helpful to me in moving toward becoming a co-conspirator by helping me to work through my grief regarding my own racism. I'm just now emerging out of my 40 days and nights in the desert and becoming ready to embrace anti-racism without debilitating and unhelpful shame or denial. One of my goals in this anti-racism work is to have views on racism and race that are unclouded by low self-esteem of guilt and insecurity or by high self-esteem of arrogance and willful ignorance. I'm working towards developing a right-sized ego that rejects seeing myself as either all terrible or all good once and forever, but instead acknowledges that I'm imperfect, I'm in process. I know I'm capable of good and bad, capable of moving up and down the scale in a single day, but hopefully learning and growing and getting better over time. Having this growth mindset along with the right-sized ego in anti-racism work is very helpful. With a growth mindset, I can acknowledge my mistakes, take personal responsibility without trying to gaslight others or make excuses. I can learn, grow, be better. Dr. Ibram X. Kendi has a wonderful image that I just love to illustrate this growth mindset. He talks about racist and anti-racist being like peelable name tags, like, hello, my name is, and writing racist or anti-racist that are placed and replaced based on what someone is doing or not doing, supporting or expressing, expressing in each moment. Finally, another major topic of discussion at church over the past year has been the idea of undertaking a thorough and honest inventory of power that we get and that we give to the systems and institutions that uphold and perpetuate race, gender, and class power imbalances. In the equity group, we've talked about how budgets are moral documents that can be studied to analyze the work of institutions toward anti-racism, anti-classism, anti-heterosexism. If we do nothing in our UCC churches, if we commit no special budget lines, no money, no time to equity work, if we don't have a policy to hire BIPOC staff or nurture relationships with BIPOC congregants, for example, we will continue to unintentionally perpetuate the racialized economic and educational segregation that is a hallmark of most of the powerful institutions in this country. That's obviously beneath us as an open and affirming anti-racist Christian institution. We know this. Like our nation with Biden and Harris today, I know that First Congregational is ready for this anti-racism co-conspirator work. I've seen us in action. We also know that we are called to this work, that the Lord requires this work of us to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. Thank you for listening and for your partnership in this ongoing peaceful struggle against racial injustice 
in our, and in our collective commitment to creating anti-racist identities and an anti-racist church. Christ be with you all.